Hi, welcome to the Research Like a Pro with DNA question and answer series. Today, we'll be talking about this question. How many DNA matches do I need to prove my hypothesis? This is a common question that we all come across towards the end of a research project. And um, right now in the study group, we're writing up our research reports. So a lot of us are thinking about this question. So a study group member submitted the following question. In writing my report, I've been wondering how many DNA matches that trace to a hypothesized relative are enough to move a distant relative relationship from a hypothesis to likely or probable. So I was thinking about this and there are just kind of different things that we need to have the qualifier likely, probable, and certain. So for certain, I would say that that means we've proven our case and we've met the GPS. So to prove a case for biological parentage being certain, you need a body of both documentary and DNA evidence. And with all that evidence, uh, you should be able to meet the genealogical proof standard. Then if you want to be able to say that your conclusion is probable, which is probably, you know, which is a step down from certain, you should be getting close to reaching the genealogical proof standard. And then to say that a report, to say in a report that a conclusion is likely, you should be including some documentary evidence some DNA evidence to support the statement, but uh, maybe you're not all the way there yet to probable or certain. So in all cases, we need to have documentary and DNA evidence, but to be certain, we need to have met the genealogical proof standard. Another thing to consider is standard 53, and this is a standard in genealogy standards about the extent of DNA evidence. And it says that we need a sufficient number of matches to propose a hypothesis, eliminate competing hypotheses, correlate with documentary research, and resolve conflicts. So that kind of shows us that it really depends on each case and the different competing hypotheses that we have to deal with. So as we're choosing which matches we want to use to help us um, prove our case, we need to think about some different criteria. And one of them is choosing matches from independent child lines. And the more matches from unique children of the common ancestor, the better. Also, we should strive for larger matches, those that are sharing more than 10 to 15 centimorgans. Also, if possible, we should try to find matches who are sharing with more than one of the test takers. And if we only have one test taker and we're trying to work with a distant research question, we probably need more than one test taker. And then of course, we want to have matches that are closer generationally to the common ancestor and also matches that are not redundant, meaning matches that are not children of other matches. Children of another match would just have the same DNA that their parent has, so we don't need them. And then also, uh, as we choose matches, it's good to try to choose lines where we can document the parent-child relationships for those lines. And if we're having difficulty documenting a line or there's some kind of conflict there, we may not want to choose a match from that line. Here's an example of some matches that I had from uh, an elder research project I was doing on my dad's side. So here's my dad, his father, and his father. And I was trying to prove Charles Rudolph Elder was the son of Daniel O'Connell Elder and Jesse Estelle Ross. All the matches I found in Ancestry, I put in this lucid chart diagram. And then to write up this in my report, I had to choose which of these matches I wanted to include because I didn't want to include all of them, nor did I need to, to achieve proof. So I selected just a few. So you can already probably guess that I didn't include all of Marcella's children. And some of these matches gave me permission to use their names, like Marcella and Hannah. Marcella's children are redundant. Their DNA that they inherited from Marcella is going to be the exact same as Marcella's. So we can just wipe all of those out and eliminate them. And the other ones I chose are one of the descendants of Carlos. And I just chose this one, although I could have chosen that one. Also, a descendant of Elsie through a different line. Vernon's grandson right here. And uh, he was one generation closer than Gary's granddaughter. So I felt that would be stronger evidence. Of course, I chose Marcella. She is the first cousin to my grandfather, who was the main test taker I used, as well as his brother, Richard. 
And so she was a no brainer to use. And then I didn't have any other matches from Benjamin except for Hannah Olson. And although she was a first cousin three times removed, she shared a significant amount of DNA. And I felt that it would be beneficial for the body of evidence to have a match descending from this brother of Charles Rudolph Elder through Benjamin. I also chose Shirley's daughter and she represented another unique child line. So I had one, two, three, four unique child lines, matches descending from them, some generationally close and others just kind of average. And so that to me was adequate evidence to feel that this was certain as I correlated it with documentary evidence. Something to think about is quality of matches versus quantity of matches. So we may see that we have a lot of matches, but are they quality? And we can determine this by analyzing them. Uh, a lot of matches tracing back to the common ancestor, even if they're through independent lines, doesn't always mean the hypothesis is correct. The example I'll share is a through lines hypothesis uh, that I evaluated. And you can see how I did this in my blog post, how to evaluate an ancestry DNA through lines hypothesis. Uh, one of the test takers in my dire research project shared their matches with me. They are a third cousin to my father-in-law. And as I was looking at their DNA matches and through lines to find additional matches for the project I was working on, I noticed this through lines hypothesis that would be a conflict to my conclusion in the dire project. And so I had to evaluate this to see if it was true. And if it was, it would have been a problem for me. But as I evaluated it, I decided it wasn't accurate. Some of the reasons that I found that it was not a good hypothesis were that, well, before I even say any of this, that the, the documentary research in the through line was inaccurate and the information was very vague and there wasn't a lot of data for the people in the through lines hypothesis. There were common names and really broad dates and places. Also, 22 of the matches were sharing under 15 centimorgans with the test taker. So most of them were small. Also, the matches didn't match the correct parent. And so back at, then when I did this, we didn't have ancestry grouping the matches to parent one and parent two, but this person's mother had tested. And so I would have expected to see all of the matches sharing 20 centimorgans and above to have said mother's side, but they didn't all say that. And so I did additional analysis to evaluate the genetic networks of each match. And it, it turns out that they were all over the network graph. They weren't all in the same cluster. And so all of these things taken together with the inaccurate documentary evidence showed that this was not correct. Although at first glance, the through lines hypothesis had a lot of matches and they were through independent lines. It still didn't prove out to be true. So how do we know if a match is a quality match? So in our body of evidence, we'd like to see some matches that share more than 10 to 15 centimorgans. Um, the more, the better. We can use some smaller matches, but the smaller the matches are, the higher the chance that they are false matches or really distant matches. We also want to see matches descending through independent child lines that are generationally close that are in the same genetic network and that we can document the lines of descent from the common ancestor. All right, in my next example, I'm going to use these qualifying words that express levels of confidence that are from Elizabeth Schoen Mill's book, Evidence Explained. And she goes through, you know, when we first have a hypothesis, we use the word perhaps to suggest that an idea is plausible, but it's still a hypothesis. It hasn't been tested yet. And maybe a little bit further down the road, we can say, apparently we've informed, we have formed an impression based on common experience, but we still haven't tested it really. It's still a hypothesis. Then when we start to test this hypothesis, we may reach possible. We feel the odds weigh at least slightly in favor of the assertion. When we say likely, we feel there's more evidence supporting it, but it's far from proved. Then once we get to these last two, we're getting really close. We've looked at a lot of evidence and we have sound research to back it up. We feel it's more likely than not, and it's probable. Then once we feel we've proved it all the way, we're certain we've met the GPS. We have no reasonable doubt. We've resolved all conflicts 
and we're basing our conclusion on good research and evidence, then we're certain. So I'm going to show you an example where I apply these labels. So in the elder case, going back one more generation than the one I showed you before, you'll see that I'm trying to evaluate based on these first three conditions. And in the example, we'll assume that all of the matches are in the same genetic network and that they all have been verified. And I did do these two bullets. I just am not showing you. So just assume that they're true. So let's say I start off with um, trying to prove that Daniel O'Connell Elder is the son of Charles Elder, who was born in 1822. And this is my second great grandfather and third great grandfather. And I, I tested, my dad tested and my grandfather tested. So we'll use my grandfather's matches because he's generally generationally closer. And then I found a match descending from a brother of Daniel O'Connell Elder, Benjamin. And this match is sharing 13 centimorgans with my grandfather. So at this point, I would say that my hypothesis is perhaps, perhaps Daniel O'Connell Elder was the child of Charles Elder based on this piece of evidence right here. It's a hypothesis. I need more to be able to know if it's real. Then I find another match and I had another test taker. So we added my grandfather's brother, Richard, as a test taker. And looking at his matches, we see he also matches this person, sharing slightly more, 18 centimorgans, and another person from Benjamin's line who he shares 10 centimorgans with. So now I'm a little bit you know, further along in this hypothesis. I think it's possible now. So I've you know, added another test taker. So even though the match is small, I've been able to see that two test takers match the person and I found another match, but it's still just through one of the child lines. I would prefer to see more matches from these other children who had known descendants. Those that are grayed out didn't have descendants or their lines petered out after one or two generations. Next, I found a match descending from George Thomas Elder, another sibling of Daniel. And these two matches are three generations removed from Charles and Richard. So they're not generationally close, but they do share a little more DNA than these two matches did. So with my grandfather and Richard sharing 20 and 15 and 26 centimorgans with this match. So that was a bit better. So I'm starting to feel better about this hypothesis because now I have two child lines represented and the test takers are matching all of them, except for Charles, my grandfather doesn't match this one. So now I'm getting closer. I think my hypothesis is now likely. Then I found an amazing match descending from another child line. James William Elder, his great granddaughter was tested and she showed up as a match and she shared a lot of DNA with Richard and Charles, 165 and 125. And when you have higher centimorgan amounts like this, it provides much stronger evidence because uh, it gives you a higher probability that they have to be in a certain category of relationship. They have to be, you know, like a first cousin once removed or a second cousin. And it's far less likely that there are some other match, some other relationship, like sixth cousin. Whereas these matches could all be third cousins once removed, twice removed, sixth cousins, seventh cousins, because they're sharing such small amounts. So we're happy to see this, and now we can feel a little bit more confident. We can say this is probably true. This is really close to being proven. Then we were able to find two more matches, also descending from George through his line. And these two matches are sharing 37 and 75 and 48 and 123. So we have some more higher matches that are generationally closer. And now we feel that we can say we've certainly proven this hypothesis to be true. So this, unfortunately, uh, I wasn't able to find a match descending from Charles Lafayette Elder. And although I wish I had one, I still feel that I've proven this conclusion with the matches I have. I have three independent child lines matching my grandfather's line. And some of the matches are higher and showing good evidence that they, they are matching on this elder line. And like I said, 
I checked and they're all in the same genetic network and I was able to document their lines going back. So with that body of evidence, I can say I've proven this case. So to answer the question, how many matches do I need? The first thing to consider is that each case is unique. So although I showed you an example, your example may be different. And an extreme example would be a case with endogamy where it will be pretty unique in how many matches you need. You'll have higher thresholds. 10 to 15 centimorgans would be much too low. You'd want to go up to 30 or 40 centimorgans for your minimum. And you'd want to have segment data instead of genetic networks because genetic networks don't usually work or help with endogamy. So when you're looking at how many matches you need, you also can consider how many children of the research subject had descendants to the present day that could possibly be DNA matches. Some lines didn't have any descendants that survived to today. And other lines had a lot of matches that survived to today, a lot of descendants. So we can look at how many lines had a lot of children and what we would expect to see from those lines. And if we're not seeing very many matches, we may need to do some targeted testing to try to get better evidence. Of course, higher amounts of shared DNA cause more certainty with less matches. So if we have higher matches, we don't need as many to feel certain. If we have lower matches, lower amounts of shared DNA, then we're going to need more matches to be more certain, to reach higher levels of certainty. So if we have a bunch of matches that are all sharing under 30 centimorgans, which is usually what happens when we're doing a case of uh, an ancestor living before 1800, then we're going to have to have quite a few more matches to help us reach that higher level of certainty. And of course, many matches through many independent lines that are all in the same genetic network can be very strong evidence, especially if they're matching more than one test taker. And this is key here. So the further back we go in time, the more test takers we need to be able to show that these matches are not just matching one person, but they're matching multiple descendants of our research subject. And taken together, this, this can provide a strong body of evidence to prove our case. So good luck as you write your report and you try to prove your cases. And if you aren't able to achieve proof and certainty this time, hopefully you can at least get to likely or probably and think of some future research suggestions like getting more test takers to help you become more certain.